Hey everybody, I'm Sam Haymart and you are watching Test Driven TV. In case you haven't heard, the Jeep Compass got a big, huge price drop. Yeah, in the age of inflation, they're lowering the price some two to three thousand dollars across the board for 2024. So we're going to take a good look at it inside and out. We're going to take it for a drive and then I'm going to tell you what I really think. Okay, my friends, let's have a conversation about what we've got here because there are a number of different angles to this story. And so we opened the video with the fact that they've done a massive price decrease for the 2024 model year. So it's worth pointing out that what I've got here is actually a 2023 model. Oddly enough, they're still handing out 2023s to the journalists out of the press fleet in March of 2024. The upshot there is the fact that the vehicle is virtually identical to anything you can buy off the lot that's a 2024, save for some color choices and a few trim treatments. Otherwise, the vehicle is 100% the same, except for that big change, the price drop. As tested, this is a Trailhawk 2023 Compass. It is $40,000 and some change in 2023. If you built this exact same vehicle on the website right now as a 2024, it would actually be $38,000 and some change with the options and packaging. As you can see from the graphic right there, they have lowered prices between two and just under $3,000 across the entire lineup. This is now the most affordable Jeep you can get in the entire brand. And that's because the Renegade's going away. That used to be the entry-level model that's been discontinued for North America. This is now the entry-level model. So the price cut was not only because this is now the entry-level and they can put that down a little bit further, but I think also because in a competitive sense, I think that price range is a little bit more realistic compared to most of the things you're going to compare this directly to. And we'll talk a bit about that more as we get into it and take it for a drive. Now, styling wise, because we are in the Trailhawk, this has a more sporting and off-road image. It also has some additional off-road cred. Wheels on this one, 17 inch black gloss alloy wheels, and they have all-terrain tires, which are a little bit better out here than the street wheels and tires, which tend to be larger diameter and have a lower sidewall. These are just much better, not only for ride, but grip and performance. Up front, the grill is a little more sporting with blacked out treatments, LED headlights. You can see those big red hooks down there in the lower fascia. Surprising though, if you look underneath, this thing doesn't really have any robust skid plating that you might expect having stepped up to the off-road model. Surprising, especially in a Jeep when Ford and Subaru and other brands like that offer that. Here we don't have it. Kind of a surprise. But as we look at the rest of the vehicle, we have some nice sporting touches, a nice graphic on the hood with flat black and red. As we come around the corner, you can see that the badging is got a nice red highlight, gives it some sport, and the color on this one especially works well in that way too. The rear three-quarter view is pretty familiar if you've been driving around in North America anytime in the last six to seven years. What has changed in the most recent refresh are taillights, which are LED, but a slightly new design. One thing that I really like about the way the coloring and the trim packaging on this one gives us a look is that normally on all the other trim grades, you have a piece of Brightwork chrome that separates the roof from the body. That looks very handsome. However, here on the Trailhawk, it's gloss black. And with the gloss black roof two-tone paint treatment that we have here, I think it just looks pretty sharp. It's very monotone for a duotone paint treatment. One thing that is worth noting is that the rear hatch on this is not a power opening hatch, not necessarily expected in the entry level. However, in this particular vehicle where we're at $40,000 between 35 and 40, depending on what year and package you get, a lot of the competition now does offer a power rear hatch when you're spending this kind of money. Down in the lower rear bumper, big red hook because we are on the Trailhawk. And one of the things I like is when you look down under the rear bumper, not a lot of big garish exhaust tips and trim and ovations there. They've just kept it simple. 
which for a practical vehicle like this really kind of makes sense, especially if you're truly going to be doing some off-roading and getting this thing up against the bush and some brush. You don't want a bunch of garish trim and things like that that are going to maybe not age so well over time. What's under the hood of the Compass is something a little bit more of an upgrade than the first time I test drove this vehicle. Now what's standard is a 2-liter 4-cylinder turbocharged engine with direct fuel injection. It has 200 horsepower and 221 pound-feet of torque. And now it comes mated to an 8-speed automatic transmission, much better than the old 9-speed that used to be here. And also standard now is all-wheel drive. And we'll get into a little bit more of the all-wheel drive and what its capabilities are when we get out on the road. But this is an engine and transmission combination that is standard across the board on all models and I think is a pretty big upgrade over what this used to have as standard equipment. The interior of the Compass in this particular one's very nicely trimmed and outfitted because we are in one of the highest trim grades. And they've redesigned the dash and much of the interior since the last time I test drove one. And so the design in here is definitely an upgrade from before. It doesn't have that same old Chrysler Dodge Jeep interior that we've seen in almost all of their vehicles by the same designer. No, this looks like it's actually from a different company. The attention to detail, the trim, the colors, the overall look and feel of it, completely different. And I like it. It looks handsome and it's got some nice trims on it that give it a quality look. Across the dash on this one, a nice sort of carbon fiber looking soft trim with some red accent stitching. What looks like brushed aluminum and then a lot of piano black, which some people love, some people hate. It looks good when it's clean. The quality of the switch gear is very good. It's very modern, and ahead of me in the instrument cluster is sort of a standard thing for Fiat, Chrysler, Stellantis, Jeep, Dodge vehicles. Two dials and a center screen with a digital readout that you can customize to some degree on what you're seeing. Leather covered steering wheel with controls and the buttons on the back for the infotainment system. The seating in here is a combination of leather and cloth. Now you can upgrade here to a higher package that offers full premium leather seating and a number of other things. Now the seats themselves are very comfortable. That is one of the highlights of this interior. These are comfortable chairs, power adjustable over here for the driver, manually for the passenger, but no memory settings here, at least with this packaging. The center console has also been redesigned. There is a cubby down here in the center for your phone. Although it does fit my phone with the case, getting it in and out of there is a little bit awkward. It's not quite laid out such that you can just throw it in and out, but it is there. Ports for all manner of connections. But in this particular case, not a wireless charger there. I do like that they've retained a traditional shifter and not a twist knob like some of the brand's other products. And then the drive mode selector here and then buttons back here for four wheel drive low, four wheel drive lock and so forth. Cup holders down low so you can put tall cups here. And then storage inside the center console is very deep. It's not so large in the width dimensions, but it's very deep. You can really put a lot of stuff down in there. And so kudos there. Seeing as how we're in the entry level, the smallest of Jeeps, even though this is a little bit larger than the previous entry level vehicle, this is a pretty comfortable space back here. My seat here is set for my height about 5'9 with my boots on. There's a few inches of knee room ahead of me here. And the seating height here is pretty good for a small crossover SUV. You're not sitting down on the floor. Now I will say that the seat does feel somewhat flat. It's not the most contoured seat. And so it doesn't, I wouldn't say it feels super comfortable let me put it that way it does have three across seating even the center spot here due to the way the pads are designed appears that it might actually be somewhat comfortable at least for a smaller person amenities back here are pretty good there's a cup holder set built into a fold down armrest here very nice not always found and then on the back of the console vents my favorite thing i mentioned it in every single test drive video I do and whether it's there or not I always point it out especially if it's not but they are here very important here in Arizona ports down there to plug your USB in as well as a 12 volt port at the bottom and so I love the fact that it's here and it's not here in some of the competitors these seats do fold down in a 60 40 split to a nearly flat load floor in the cargo area and pretty easy to do too it's not a big process there's plenty of storage back there. It's a pretty good cargo hold. And underneath that floor is a spare tire. Very important for a vehicle like this 
when we're out in the trail like we're going to be doing here shortly and out there there's no cell service if i were to cut a tire open a rock out there and this didn't have a spare we'd be in trouble this is an interior that i think is vastly improved over before and especially with the new lower price point the quality of materials in here the level of fit and finish and the level of equipment is almost just right yes you can spend more you can get more but where we're at for this price at least for the new pricing i think we're just right this interior gets five out of five stars the infotainment system we have here is the standard system it's not the upgraded system that you can get with the higher packaging but this is the system you're going to find on even the base models 10.1 inch screen it has apple carplay android auto standard satellite radio and a pretty good level of sound even though this doesn't have the upgraded alpine sound system the one thing it does have missing here is navigation even with a subscription it doesn't have it here which at this price point of this particular vehicle i do find sort of missing but as a system that's a base system everything else that it does have in terms of feature content makes it pretty well rounded the graphics are good they're crisp they're clear they're easy to understand and figure out on the go navigating around pretty easy and you can delve into the settings for the vehicle and media and even the climate control here so that you can get a finer point on it even though most of the climate control settings are down below and you need not really get into that necessarily but you can if you choose to the backup camera on this one is a single view camera and uh, it does turn when you turn the wheel so that you can see lines where you're going it helps with parallel parking so you don't curb your wheels so this is a well-rounded system that's fully featured i like the fact that it's got most of the things we want here i do find myself wanting though for navigation especially when we get over $35,000. Even though you can get it and you can spend more, it really should be here at this price. The system gets four out of five stars. So we're gonna to come to a complete stop. We're out in the middle of nowhere. And go. Ooh, you can hear it. You can hear it. And 60. So it makes quite a bit of racket. That's my first observation. Now, the new engine and the new transmission since the last time we test drove it, the two liter turbocharged engine does put out a reasonably good amount of power, but not nearly as powerful as other two liter turbocharged engines offered by the competitors. Ford, for example, has 250 horsepower and other brands, they just offer more. This eight-speed automatic transmission does a reasonably good job of shifting. It is better than the old nine-speed, which was just an awful box of rocks. I am so glad that is gone for good. It is noisy though. It sounds very agricultural. It makes a lot of noise. And when you're around town and it's just churning back and forth, shifting gears, it just kind of groans and moans. And so it's ever present with the noise, vibration and harshness. And the other thing I noticed around town is that the transmission really just has kind of a lot of backlash. You know, it's always kind of jerking and clunky, just really not the most refined gearbox in town. This also has auto start stop, which is not one of my favorite features ever. And so it does have an off switch right here on the dash, but you have to turn it off every time you get in the car. Very annoying. So this is a powertrain that while it does have more power than it used to, it does offer features like all-wheel drive, standard. It really just, to me, in a lot of ways, falls behind the competition and living with it every day. EPA fuel economy here is 24 city, 32 highway, and 27 MPG combined, which is actually pretty impressive on paper. In my week with it driving it around, I got about 23 miles to the gallon which is quite a bit less than is promised for the combined, but even less than what is promised for the city. And that includes highway driving. And one of the reasons for that, and I find with a lot of turbocharged four cylinder engines is that while they rate pretty high on the MPG, if you actually use them, if you actually dip into their horsepower, they tend to get very thirsty. So while the power is increased and the standard all wheel drive is great, it, it lacks the refinement that some of the competitors do, and it does get pretty thirsty. Oh, and it doesn't have nearly as much horsepower as other similarly sized competitors. This powertrain gets three out of five stars. When it comes to the ride, drive, and handling experience, this actually has a pretty competent chassis on the pavement. 
McPherson strut front suspension and a Chapman strut rear suspension with multi-links, which essentially means it's independent. Although not quite as sophisticated as some of the competitors that offer a full, true multi-link setup. On our 70 mile an hour highway test, the decibel reading came in at 59.9 decibels, which is pretty good for the highway. It's about average, maybe slightly less, so it's pretty quiet on the highway. Around town, over speed bumps and speed humps, it does tend to get a little bit harsh as the suspension can bottom out somewhat, but if you're just doing normal everyday driving, it tends to be average. Out here on a back road on curves, it has a pretty good level of firmness, which gives you some level of confidence out here. It feels stable, even though it does tend to sit pretty high. Because we're test driving the Trailhawk, I was really most excited to bring this out to my favorite desert washboard road and get it off the pavement a little bit because this is the place the last Jeep Compass I test drove really let me down and that was because it just had a really rough unrefined chassis. It wasn't really robust enough to handle the rigors of, well, less than smooth pavement. It rode rough. It shook, it rattled, it squeaked, it shuddered. It was just really disappointing for a vehicle that says Jeep on the hood. Now we're not really gonna be doing any heavy off-roading today. We're mainly just sort of driving this out here on my trail to sort of see how it handles. The Trailhawk does come with an off-road suspension and it has a more robust all-wheel drive system than the standard one. This has an ultra-low crawl ratio and it actually enables you to lock the all-wheel drive system. It defaults to front-wheel drive most of the time. It has a disconnect so that it can save gas, but when you lock it, that forces all-wheel drive to happen. So I'm really looking to see if this has an improved ride and drive experience out here in the rough than does the standard compass. Well, so here's what I'm finding out. I don't know if you heard some of those loud crashes, but the higher sidewall in the tire and the smaller diameter wheel does help out quite a bit when it comes to the ride quality. It doesn't beat you to death nearly as bad. However, the suspension itself is really still a car suspension. It's just really sort of a mild steel feeling strut suspension that really isn't designed for treating too roughly. These struts up front and the suspension crashes and it booms and it really bottoms out easily when you go over some of these really not that rough ruts and some of these washes, it just really makes a lot of noise and it really makes this thing feel like a giant POS if I'm honest. And I hate to use that terminology, but that's kind of where it's at. So if you buy this thing to bring out to a rough trail like this, you're really not going to get a driving experience in my mind that's much different from any economy car. And that's unfortunate because that's why you buy this. So on the highway, around town, this is a vehicle that drives pretty comfortably and, and pretty adeptly, but if you bring it out here, even the Trailhawk, and you really sort of push it, you know, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna show its rough edges pretty quickly. So this chassis gets three out of five stars. All right, my friends, we've talked about it inside and out. We've taken it for a drive. The big question now is, is it worth the money? How does it compete? Especially now that it's got that price cut, right? Two to $3,000 less, it should be a better value, right? Well, I always like to talk about what would you compare this to? Ford Bronco Sport, Subaru Crosstrek. To me, those are the closest competitors in this category, especially if we're talking about one like this that's got an increased off-road capability, the Trailhawk. If you look at the Bronco Sport and the Subaru Crosstrek, those are vehicles that are really geared toward the same buyer here, offering tires and suspension and four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive systems that are a little bit more robust, right? And so you can look at Honda, you can look at Nissan, Toyota, Hyundai, Kia, if you get some of the lesser off-road version models. And I think those are competitors that are very worthy. Here we have a vehicle that has pricing that is a little bit more in line, I think, than it was just last year. 
This one as tested as a 2023 model is $40,000 and some change. And if you build the exact same one on the website right now, it's $38,000 and some change. Pretty big price cut. And then there's incentives on top of that, right? So this is a vehicle that in traditional American brand form, you can, you can really wheel and deal and get the price less. Whereas some of the competitors out there, particularly those from import brands, they're not so willing to negotiate. So in some ways, this is a vehicle that you can probably get for less money than a lot of those competitors, but is it the best vehicle? I'm not sure. We talked about quality, we talked about powertrain, pretty rough, unrefined powertrain, even though it is improved over what it used to be. It's still, comparatively speaking out there in the market, one of the least refined powertrains that you can get, in my opinion. The chassis, ah, you know, it's supposed to be Jeep. It's supposed to be really rugged and really robust out here. And it still kind of falls short in some ways of that Jeep badge on the hood, I think. It just, uh, it's a car. It's a car with a Jeep emblem on it when it comes to its overall form. It looks kind of like an SUV, but it drives like a car. Not a bad thing. Subaru Crosstrek, Ford Bronco Sport, not very far from the same formula. So when I look at value here, just like in 2017, when we first test drove this new generation, I put value at four out of five stars still. And when you put that in with everything we've already talked about, well, the final score is four out of five stars, just like it was back in 2017. So there you go, our test drive of the Jeep Compass Trailhawk. So there you go. If you like what we do, see our latest video right there. Better yet, subscribe to your YouTube channel right down there. Either way, stay tuned.